Hi, Nancy. Hi, Shane. Uh, I don't have a what's your favorite question. Good. I'm so week. happy. Because <laughs> that question is not my favorite. I do have a question for you, though, which also might not be your favorite. What did you want to be when you grow up? Oh, that's a good one. That's, no, that is a good one. Yeah. I'm, when I was young, I actually wanted to be an architect. Oh. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. What, do you remember what drove that? I don't know. I used to love to like make little architectural drawings of of houses and stuff. I, I was like, really into it. I and I honestly like. I took an architecture class in college, and I don't know. I kind of gave up on that. Went like the science route, but um, mm. I liked. I, I don't know. I really enjoyed it. I should have. See. Oh well. But if if you did that, you wouldn't be here with me. That's all that really ma- matters. Right. <laughs> <laughs> for for me, I don't really think. I, I think back on this and I didn't have a dream kind of growing up. I don't think I was really ambitious until college. And then I was like, oh, I want to be a scientist. But these days I have no idea. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I say that now, but like, I still don't know what I want to be when I actually grow up. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. It, it turns out I'm I'm I guess I'm trying to be a podcaster. I feel like young me would be so disappointed. I mean, like, <laughs> not, a, not a firefighter, not a, not a doctor, well, not, not an MD, at least, uh, or, or even like an astronaut. Right podcaster right (laughs) science is fascinating but don't just take my word for it join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone i'm shane hamlin and i'm nancy boppy and this is third pod from the sun okay so i took you back to your childhood aspirations uh which were very commendable, I have to say. Like, Thank you. Super impressive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because today we're talking with someone who didn't necessarily want to become an astronaut, but knew that they wanted to do something with space. I know how you love space as well. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, here's the deal, right? If you've been if you've been listening for a while, uh, you know that I've had some unfair feelings on space. Uh, but that was then. And this is now. New podcast, new year, new feelings. And... and frankly excitement about space like i'm i'm here for all the new telescopes and all of that i have turned over a new leaf and so very excited to hear more about space so without further ado let's get into it our interviewer was ashley hamer i'm tanya harrison and i am the director of strategic science initiatives at planet labs Nice. And what what is that? What do you do there? It's kind of all over the place in a good way. There's so many different people doing so many different types of research that you could have a meeting in the morning about saving walruses in Alaska. And then you have another meeting later where you're talking about coral reefs in the South Pacific. And then you're talking to someone about volcanoes. And then you're talking about marine plastic debris. So like tracking trash in the ocean. And it's really amazing. It's so different from being, you know, in my old life as a researcher where I was focused on sort of one specific thing. Now I get to interact with a ton of researchers doing anything you could possibly think of. And that's really, really exciting. All of that with like satellite imagery and data about our planet. We just like, you you can see the coral reefs, you can see the walrus populations with satellites. Yeah, you can see all of these things from space, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. So just to step back, what what is it that drew you to science in the first place? There was sort of a, a coming together of a bunch of things around the age of five that I think were all super influential. One was growing up watching a lot of Star Trek. Another was the Magic School Bus Lost in the Solar System book. I actually have the copy from when I was like four or five years old on my oh. bookshelf behind me still. And randomly, the movie Big Bird in Japan, which does not sound like it would be space-related at first, but in the movie, Big Bird ends up meeting Kaguyuheime, who is the mythological princess of the moon in Japan. There's actually a Kaguya mission named after this, this princess that the Japanese space agency she sent to the moon. And for some reason, that caused me to just go out every night and I would stare at the moon and stare at the stars It just kind of evolved from there. And then I focused in on Mars specifically when the Pathfinder mission landed and the little Sojourner rover drove out onto the surface of Mars. And I thought, that's that's so cool. I can't believe that we're driving robots on another planet. Like, I want to work on that. And so I became super focused. I was like, I got to figure out what I got to do to work on these rovers. (laughs) 
when I was young, I wasn't really encouraged to go down this pathway because the thought was, well, if you want to work in space, you have to be an astronaut. And you're probably not going to be an astronaut because like I have a physical disability. So I was never going to make it through the, the, the test to become an astronaut. And I knew that, but there weren't a lot of other options shown to you about ways that you could work in the space sector. And so now that you have access to things like social media, where you can see like tons of amazing women working on these projects and just the diversity of jobs that are out there, that was something that we didn't really have even you know, five, 10 years ago. And so I think there's been a revolution there for people to see all the different ways that they can get involved in space, whether it's engineering or, you know, being a photographer that that photographs launches or an artist that does renderings of exoplanets. Like there's so many different opportunities out there now. So I have a condition called ankylosing spondylitis, which is sort of an inflammatory arthritic condition where your body decides that certain connective tissues are bad and eats away at them. And then uh, since it can't replace them, it starts to replace them with bone instead. And so you end up with like joints fusing together and stuff like that. It's not fun. And certainly as a geologist, it was tricky because geology is a very physical field. (laughs) You tend to go out on you know, field trips for school and you'll, they want you to hike for miles or climb up mountains or scale rocks. And I couldn't do any of those things. So I felt like I was missing out in a lot of, um, a lot of settings, like in, in field courses, I didn't feel like I was gaining everything that I should be because I either physically couldn't do what they wanted me to do. So I'd be left in a van somewhere while everybody else would go off to their site. And I would just wait for hours or I would try to do stuff and then find out part way I couldn't do it. And like someone would carry me back from the field and it's a good bonding experience, I guess, with your classmates. Um, but you know, also embarrassing at the same time. And you, you shouldn't have to do that. There's ways to design these courses where they are more accessible to people that are not physically able to hike for miles and miles on end. Right. I mean, it strikes me that Satellite imagery is very accessible. Do you find that that maybe as technology has has improved, things are getting more accessible for science? Absolutely. I think the fact that we have really high resolution data from space, it's certainly not a complete replacement for going out in the field somewhere. I mean, that's that's why we send rovers to Mars and on top of satellites. Having that on the ground data is really helpful, but you can still tell a lot of the story in a ton of different settings from the satellite imagery. And so you know, it it's really revolutionary to be able to sit at your desk and do a lot of geology rather than going out into the field. I'm a big fan of space myself, and I know that the the emotion that I feel when I think about space that's different than other areas of science is awe because it's so big and we're so small in it. Is that is that kind of your main emotion about space, or do you have another? Uh, is there other appeal for you? That's a good question. Certainly the sense of awe, I think, is the the big attractor because it seems so extraordinary and like things that you wouldn't encounter on a day-to-day basis. And so we're kind of fascinated as humans about things that are just exotic and we don't quite understand them. So like dark matter or antimatter or, you know, planets where you have volcanoes that are spewing sulfur or like gas giants where there's no surface and we could never live there, but you wonder what's going on like underneath all the clouds. I think it's something that just really sparks curiosity for folks compared to sort of the, the day to day. It's not, it's just not as, I don't want to say it's not as engaging, but it's not engaging in the same way. Like it doesn't engage your creativity and your imagination in the same way. Yeah. Well, kind of as a, as a, Parting question, what words of advice do you have for people who want to get into the sciences like you are? There's still that sort of toxic-ish attitude in academia that it is the right way. And if you go to industry, you're selling your soul. But there just aren't enough jobs in academia for everybody. So we we need to be realistic. And we shouldn't shame people that don't want to stay in academia because at the end of the day, you got to be able to pay your rent. So whatever whatever way you choose... Like, there's no wrong decision there. It's just whatever the right decision is for you. (laughs) 
So, Nancy, do you think you chose the right career? Well, along with my architectural aspirations, I also always love to write and read. So I think that I'm in, you know, communications. That makes sense. Yeah. And honestly, at this point, we're getting paid to sit in my basement and talk to each other. So, I mean, that's not too terrible. No, and you're buying me dinner after this. I am probably <laughs> buying you dinner. That is that is very true. Um, well, anyways, I, I do want to thank Tanya for chatting with us and giving these the opportunity to chat with one another and have a good meal after this. Yes, um, and special thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interview, NASA for sponsoring this series, and to Karen Romano-Young for her amazing illustration of Tanya. This episode was produced by me with audio engineering by Colin Warren. We would love to hear your thoughts. Please rate and review our podcast, and you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week. Are you checking your email? Oh, God. We're in a meeting. <laughs> We're in a meeting, Nancy. <laughs>